we have the opportunity to create the best futures for the most people. Hello from the future, and welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast, presented by Hippo Direct. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who's unleashing creativity to grow their business. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, digital marketing due to Hippo Direct, and you know you can reach me at max at hippodirect.com with any questions on podcasting or digital marketing. This is episode number 35, and today's guest is Kate O'Neill. She's the author of Tech Humanist and the founder of KO Insights. And to give you a little sneak peek into her life, she was one of the first 100 employees at Netflix. She started off this year going viral, and she followed it up the following month by speaking at the UN. There's much, much more where that came from. Enjoy the show with Kate O. All righty, we are here with the amazing Kate O, Kate O'Neill, the founder and CEO of KO Insights, and she's done... You're doing an incredible amount of things. I don't even know where to start. But Kate, how are you doing today? Thanks for joining us in person at this amazing Peer Space shared office here in New York. Thanks. I, I'm excited to be here. It uh, was really close and easy to get to, except that today is the day when we're having snow and sleet and all kinds of craziness outside. Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I appreciate you breaking out the shovel and digging out of your place and right. uh, showing up with full body uh, sledding gear. So, no. <laughs> But there's a lot of different directions we can start with this. I'm going to start with a very serious question. Are you a robot? <laughs> I I'm guess just... it's funny. I, uh, I have uh, gotten into that whole I am not a robot joke as an opening for my keynotes. And I got <laughs> given a t-shirt at one point when I was appearing somewhere. Someone came over and gave me a t-shirt that said I am not a robot. So I love that that's caught on. That there we go. Associate yeah. that with me. Exactly. I do think it's funny also that one of my friends that I met online initially when he encountered my account, he thought I was a bot. So I kind of joke no with him all the time about that. <laughs> Like, well, I, really I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it's crazy. I mean, to be fair, I, I ask that question to everyone, so it's a little, you know. <laughs> no, but really, but you, you've been up to so many incredible things across a wide range of industries. Uh, and you mentioned earlier that we could make this last hours and hours if we wanted to talk about everything you did, or it would just be a never ending podcast. That'd be kind of cool if you're up for the challenge. But how would you describe yourself? Like in a brief, simple way, when people ask, what do you do? What are you up to? How do you introduce yourself? That's always such a funny challenge because, you know, the, everybody is so invested in the idea of like elevator pitches. Mm -hmm. And I find that when you really want to connect with someone and make them understand what you're about, you're going to be context sensitive, right? Yeah. So I guess like in a sense, that's my introduction is I care about context. I care about human connection mm -hmm. and I care about meaning and the relative ways that like things matter to us. If, if I care care about something and you care about something different, there's probably a, a thread that connects those things. And so mm -hmm. I want to find that thread and I want to really emphasize that. So it takes right. the shape in my work of, you know, talking about the impact that technology has on human experiences, mm -hmm. but it's taken the shape in my work of a lot of different things over the years. And I've always been fascinated with the way we use technology to communicate and connect with other humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and technology may be growing a little bit, like, you know, you may know a thing or two about it. But you mentioned that point about tech and how it interacts with our lives and how we, you know, you, you had the new book, Tech Humanist. Uh, you sometimes describe yourself as, tech, as a tech humanist. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a really, really cool niche you're in and it's super important. Uh, but for anybody that's not too familiar with your background, can you give a little bit of how you got started with your professional career? Uh, how you got to KO Insights and what's the biggest thing you're focused on today? Yeah, sure. So uh, that's sort of three questions in one, but I'll see. Yeah, well, I can add a few more if you want. We can, <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is a never ending interview. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny because my, uh, since I mentioned I, I use this lens of meaning to look at my work, it's appropriate, I guess, that I should start by saying that I was a linguist by education. I majored in German and minored mm. in Russian and linguistics with a concentration in international <laughs> studies. And Ooh. my grad work was in <laughs> linguistics and language development. So it, it's all language all the time with me, except that it was around the time that I was in undergrad was when the web came about. So that dates me. Uh, and I no, learned I, how to... <laughs> remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> I learned how to uh, build a website just so that I could build the website for the language laboratory, which I was supervising. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to have been 
like the first or one of the first departmental websites at the University of Illinois at Chicago. <laughs> and that, like, I don't know if any, how many of the listeners today are, were paying attention to the web in like 94, but there were mm. manually curated lists of like what was new on the web yeah. every day because you could keep up with it. You know, like it's so strange to, to imagine that. But uh, somebody right. at Toshiba found my new, newly created website, and uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up being recruited out to Toshiba to build their intranet for them, <laughs> which I didn't know how to do. But <laughs> nobody else did either, so yeah. I figured it out. Well, everyone else is focused on internet. You're focused on intranet at the yeah. time. So <laughs> it's an interesting problem to solve. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so you know that started a whole stint of that was in, in the Bay Area, and it started a whole stint of working for. Uh, tech companies in Silicon Valley in the 90s and um, again one thing led to another sort of like this is like skip 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 uh, next step profit sort <laughs> of thing forward, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was in one of the first uh, 100 employees at Netflix in uh, the, obviously the early days like yeah. 99 2000 and huh. that was like a super fun challenge to uh, to be part of and I headed up the I was it was the first content manager um, so I was helping kind of create this information architecture structural content role and that was really uh, awesome too i got to got yeah. to be part of creating all these uh e-commerce protocols that were new but mm -hmm. are now standard like personalized content on the home page and that's things like that insane because we, when you know i'm a millennial so just to be stereotypical <laughs> like i see netflix on the inside of my eyelids like it's <laughs> everywhere it's every third word i say i'll start working in for the rest of the interview but it's <laughs> such a beast of a company and i think that's amazing that you were an early employee or your early team member in that company yeah what was that was like cool. like did you did anybody know at the time that it would become this beast that totally would revolutionize the the media and content industry? Well, you know, I think it's the, the most important thing to point out is that the person who most knew that it was going to become the beast that it is was Reed Hastings, the CEO. Mm. And I thought you were going to say you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really enjoyed the that's fact that thing. Reed, um, in let's say 2000, because I think that's about when I saw it happening, mm -hmm. Reed was investing money into like R&D money into set top boxes, which were the mm -hmm. predecessor to streaming as we know it, you know, like the Roku was sort of a, a quasi set top box, right? Or it was a set top box, and, and it led to streaming. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to, to think that in 2000, which, you know, Netflix was still engaged in all out bloody war with Blockbuster. And yeah. uh, it was not clear who was going to be the victor. Right. Well, I remember getting the DVDs in the mail. Like yeah. it was so long before, you know, in, in my family's not like the earliest adopters with everything. But I remember it was so long before we switched from DVDs to just the streaming and the, yeah. the online. And it was, it was kind of special. Like it's, there's a little nostalgia in opening up the mail and getting a new... <laughs> Uh, film DVD every time, but like sure. that stuff seems like a thousand years ago now. Like, I know, and it, it really kind of was. I mean, 2000 uh, again is is when I'm talking about that he's making these investments. 2006 mm -hmm. is the earliest that Roku is available. 2007 is the streaming mm -hmm. plan is introduced on Netflix. So I mean, when you think about that timeline, at six or seven years ahead of its earliest sort of introduction to the market. Reed is already thinking like, right. well, we have to solve this post DVD problem because he's assuming they're going to survive the DVD like, right. era. So that that to me is one of the coolest examples of yeah. like visionary leadership that mm -hmm. I've ever experienced yeah. firsthand. Yeah, the foresight there. Mm -hmm. And was he like? I know nowadays they part of why they've had so much momentum is they spend so much for the rights for these productions and all that was it like I mean, you don't have to give numbers obviously <laughs> but back in the day was it was it like large amounts like he was everybody knew like wow he's really going all in in this r&d in these new areas like he's heavily investing in them i mean the streaming portion of that the set top box research i don't think was huge numbers because it, it couldn't be it was like some small portion of the overall <laughs> the the budget right <laughs> yeah. but and and i don't know that original content was on anybody's radar for mm -hmm. a really long time I think it's just one of those things where if you if you want to think about growth as this kind of trajectory of, of meaning as it relates to a company strategy, mm -hmm. that to me is what they are one of the most interesting examples because they've pivoted okay. at least like four times and yeah. they've always had this North Star vision of what they're doing that still makes sense every single time right. and brings even more dominance with it. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. pretty and clever. I I remember there was a time where I don't remember if they were officially bankrupt or they were nearing it, but they, there was a time where it seemed like Netflix was going to be no more. And like, there wasn't nobody except Reed, obviously, and you <laughs> had the 
you know, vision in mind that it was going to become such a monster that it is now. And literally the fact that people aren't watching regular TV anymore besides like sporting events or live events is insane. Yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> I think, you know, no, make no mistake. Like they, they did uh, make some strategic errors. There was the whole quick start or someone I can't remember where it was where they were trying to split off the DVD service and the mm. and streaming service into different brands and I mean that that seemed like it was backed by data within the company but mm -hmm. you know nobody outside of the company thought it made any sense and, yeah. and all of that to say like it's never going to be an easy road I think for companies to sustain that right. kind of growth and to navigate the the weirdnesses of the market and changing culture <laughs> and you know they've changed culture too to your point like yeah. nobody does appointment television anymore or mm -hmm. you know very few of us engage right. in that yeah so it's a, it's a viewing habit this changed it's a cultural habit this changed it's a touch point in culture that we now have and that we yeah. didn't have before which I think is really interesting yeah and you were there right at the start <laughs> which is crazy like i don't know how many people even knew that netflix was around in the early 2000s like there's probably a lot of people that thought you know past few years but for uh so let's move on we'll, yeah, fa yeah. we'll fast forward a little bit in your but, career yeah, sure. so what what took you to eventually you know start doing speaking writing books and um the whole thing with ko insights yeah so the the next years after i i uh, was consulting and i eventually started my own uh, agency called Meta Marketer, and mm -hmm. within Meta Marketer, I was doing a lot of uh, sort of presenting case studies of our clients. What I kept finding was that as the companies we worked with focused more on meaningful experiences, mm -hmm. they were becoming more successful. If if we just helped them figure out their their overall sort of business model, how to measure it with meaningful data, and how to keep emphasizing a meaningful customer experience they kept seeing more and more profit. And I just mm -hmm. saw this again and again. And so I kept bringing these case studies out to speak at conferences. And the more I was doing that, the more I would get invited to do it. And, and uh, <laughs> so it was just a nice, like sort of organic process that right. I was doing a lot of speaking with, with that. And, and I think to the, the larger point there is that I took away that this message or this, this sort of lesson mm -hmm. was becoming a, a really important one to share. And it's been sort of the driving message of my career for the last probably 12 years mm -hmm. is that whole emphasis on assuming you have a valid business model, assuming that you know, right. it works at some level. Yeah, you might need to make sure that's <laughs> yeah. <a> thing first. <laughs> the, the more you focus on creating some sort of relevance, some sort of alignment, some sort of mm -hmm. meaning in the experiences that you're, you're creating for people, and bringing that back into the business in terms of insights and awareness of what the company, the customers want, what the market wants. The more you do that, mm -hmm. the more successful you will become. And yeah. I, it just, it is universally true, I find. So I, yeah. I'm really excited that that has, that has shaped my work. So KO Insights is basically what I was doing with MetaMarketer minus the client services. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So probably, probably a little bit easier on your, on your data, on your lifestyle. But yeah. We'll well, it's, it's so important. I feel like my mission now, my purpose, I, I, I encourage companies to talk about what their purpose is in mm -hmm. really simple terms, not in this extravagant language of like synergize or leverages or whatever, you know, like the, right. <laughs> the stuff that yeah. the quasi language that people use is not meaningful. Yeah. But I think like if you can distill what you're trying to achieve with your company and trying to achieve at scale mm -hmm. down to three to five to maybe seven words... In my case with KO Insights and in my career, that message is to um, help make more meaningful experiences, like create more mm -hmm. meaningful experiences. And yeah. so what I find is that the way that I can do that most effectively is by speaking to large groups of people and mm -hmm. writing books and, you know, yeah. to having the most reach possible. Right. So the more people, more executives and leaders, cultural leaders, city leaders, you know, all types of audiences, mm -hmm. but people who are making decisions and creating experiences for humans... Yeah. The more of those I can speak to or write to or somehow address, mm -hmm. the more I can hope to, you know, sort of help create those more meaningful experiences. Yeah, that's really good. And my purpose, I'd have to say, would be asking people if they're robots. <laughs> it all, it all comes back to that. And you do it so well. <laughs> Thank you. I, I've been practicing and practicing. <laughs> So let's move on. So you've kind of hinted at it a little bit, but let's get into this tech humanist space. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've used the term to describe yourself, but also you have a, uh, a book that's doing very well that came out, when was it, August? September? September, yeah. September 2018. So for anybody that's not familiar with the term, can you give a quick definition of what 
it means to be a tech humanist and why it's important? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the the guiding principle to me is that as uh, as tech accelerates, it's creating more capacity, mm-hmm. and it's business drivers that are largely pushing tech forward. So the opportunity, I think, is to get business to align its objectives with human objectives so that we can use that capacity to solve human experiences at scale or right. solve human challenges and human problems mm-hmm. at scale. Okay. So the real world human problems that we face, like poverty, mm-hmm. climate change, you know, things like that, mm-hmm. are often beyond the scope of an ordinary company or you know, just your average right. company. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a way for that company to find some alignment with something mm-hmm. that that makes people's experiences better or lives better in some small way. Right. So the more we do that, I think the more the sort of exhaust from business is going to be beneficial for for humans. So right. I think that's mm-hmm. the overall message is we have the opportunity to make what I always say in the book and, and elsewhere is the best futures for the most people. Mm-hmm. And I think we have the opportunity to do that and we have the ethical obligation to do that. So this is kind of a movement that I guess I'm trying to start. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. And, and you're doing it very well. Thanks. You can, you can feel the wave. But can you give a few examples of some, I guess, conceptually simpler things that businesses can do to better embrace technology and use them in the proper way, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I think it's every type of technology that's emerging now um, in terms of like automation, chatbots, uh, Internet of Things, like beacons mm-hmm. and sensors and things like that, uh, as well as the the whole umbrella of artificial intelligence has the, you know, sort of the opportunity to create experiences for people within it, right? So right. everything that, you know, you get a call center and people, you have humans fielding phone calls from customers, let's say in the 1990s version mm-hmm. of the scenario. Before and Netflix. In the, yeah. <laughs> and in the 2019 and forward version of the scenario, a lot of those uh, interactions are happening via chatbot mm-hmm. or some sort of anticipatory technology that if a company does that well, it's an asset both to the company because they can deploy resources more efficiently and have uh, the human operators, you know, sort of looking at the overall patterns of the the chatbot interactions and mm-hmm. making sure that they're nuanced, but they can they can be more efficient. They can serve more people right. uh, simultaneously. Yeah, and it gets people their answers faster. The people who are actually calling in. I wrote an essay which became part of Tech Humanist about whether a, a bot should have to tell you it's a bot. And in some of the research that I've <laughs> come across in that, it turns out that most people. I think most people care not to be lied to, but I think most people don't care whether it's a bot or a human that's servicing their customer service function. They just want to get the job done. They want, they want something that's going to help them, you know, get to success. It depends how well the job is done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's for sure. And how nuanced it is, like, right. Mm -hmm. How aligned it is with what you're actually trying to accomplish. So I think there's huge opportunities to use automation, use Mm -hmm. chatbots, you know, all of these kinds of technologies in ways that serve you know, sort of customer interests, human interests, and also that make the business more successful in the process. Yeah. It's just a matter of finding that right alignment and making sure that those things are being served simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's spot on. And it's something that is important to keep top of mind. Like people, you need to embrace the movement, Kato's movement. But, <laughs> I'm all about uh, it. <laughs> but um, as, far, as far as data and privacy is always a big issue, there's so much data everywhere. I never know if it's right to say data or data. So well, <laughs> I think I go back and that, forth. That's an aside. So there's so much data slash data everywhere. And now it's the growing and growing population that has these Amazon Echo devices in their homes. Everybody's mm-hmm. using smartphones. And so companies are collecting data all the time. And, you know, any company with their, with their email lists, um, which kind of is an area that we're big on. And there's so many opportunities for them to grab data. What, what are your thoughts on privacy? I mean, do you think there still exists a certain amount of privacy or do you think it's kind of dwindling with as technology grows and grows yeah it's a big big question to ponder i I wrote a lot about it in my last book pixels in place Mm -hmm. one of the sort of guiding thoughts there is that everywhere interesting that the physical world and digital world connect it happens through us through humans like our human data when we're moving around and our phones are collecting data about us and everything and and beacons and sensors are collecting data and all of that it's all part of this mesh of informing this sort of intersection of digital and physical worlds. Right. But it's all around human experience. So I, I think it, as far as privacy goes, there's kind of this longstanding equation of 
the trade-offs between privacy, convenience, and mm -hmm. security. And I think those those trade-offs are still valid to consider, but I, I think we've gone so far down this trail yeah. of giving over so much data and the conveniences we've gotten haven't always been uh, in proportion to that. And mm -hmm. the security hasn't necessarily been in proportion to that because right. there have been so many leaks and breaches. And, <laughs> you know, yeah, so exactly. I think we're at a point where it's worth kind of stepping back from that and having this conversation at a broader level mm -hmm. and, and deciding that there's more accountability that we can expect of companies, that there's more regulation we can ask for from government that's appropriate, right. appropriately sized and, you know, what that looks like is open for debate, but I think we have to have something in there. And then, of yeah. course, to expect of ourselves as humans that we become more sophisticated over time. That, right. you know, proportional to the amount of data we're generating, we have to get savvier about, you know, what we're giving up in exchange for every experience. Yeah. And, you know, hold businesses accountable and hold government accountable to create regulations. And it's a three-part scenario or three-part mm -hmm. strategy but I don't think that privacy can be considered gone or that we should right. just kind of give up on it. I yeah. think that it's an important ongoing equation for us to understand how it, how it morphs and adapts with cultural landscape and, you know, sort of changing expectations. But there's, there's never going to be a lack of need for, you know, some sense semblance of privacy or some semblance of right. individual protection of your own data. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what that's going to look like as time goes on. And it's important for us yeah. to continue having that conversation. Yeah. And it totally depends on the person because a lot of the time, if a company has more data about you, theoretically, they can better treat your needs. Mm -hmm. um, it's when that gets abused or gets leaked and you know everything gets public, things like that, then that's obviously a big problem. You hit on the point of sophistication and sort of being more savvy with these different things. And that brings up another issue, which I find very interesting, is how much time we spend in front of screens mm -hmm. and unplugging. And, you know, I, everybody likes unplugging from time to time, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on how often you should unplug, what's the... Well, let's start with that because yeah. I asked like four questions at a time. So. <laughs> How often I, do you think? You know, it's funny. I've never been a fan of unplugging as a concept. I mm -hmm. think, you know, I'm much more interested in the idea of integration. And uh, for me, like the whole discussion of sort of work-life balance has always been a, an arbitrary and absurd one because <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like the best answer to that question is always integration. It's always finding what's yeah. meaningful about your life and then pursuing it no matter what arena you're in, whether it's professional or personal. And and that right. is a privileged thing to say. I realize not everyone has the opportunity to do that. But to the extent we have some control over those situations, I think that's the ideal is, mm -hmm. is to strive for that. In yeah. a similar way, I think like the digital detox or unplugging or whatever feels a little too like uh, compartmentalizing that part of your life when in reality, right. I feel like that's very much an integrated part of your life. And it is. I like to just approach it all with sort of a healthy mindfulness that, mm -hmm. you know, I am not going to spend too much of my time frittering away on, you know, Twitter and Facebook, yeah. although I do love... By the way, way to <laughs> rhyme fritter with Twitter there. Okay. <laughs> it's my okay. songwriter coming out. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you did use... Well, now that you brought it up. Yeah. I know you used to be a songwriter for a little bit in yeah. Nashville. Yeah. Is that... It's what I moved to Nashville for back in the early <laughs> 2000s. Yeah. Uh, so That's, yeah, it still comes out every once in a while. A little internal rhyme never wow. hurt anybody. I love uh, exactly. <laughs> well, let's let's continue frittering away. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, I think this is just of of the um, the opportunity there. I think is not necessarily to to decide that oh now I've hit my allotment for the week and I better just not use my yeah. phone or not use screens, but instead you know kind of approach overall thinking about how your the time you spend is going to be most meaningful and how you're mm -hmm. going to be mindful and present with the people who are around you in person right. and also mindful and present with the people that you're interacting with online mm -hmm. uh, and just bring as much meaningfulness to those encounters as you possibly can i think it always helps to remember that it's fundamentally about connecting with people in either scenario. Yeah, it is. And that's my favorite part of social media is, I mean, when you remember that it's another person on the, you know, unless you're chatting with the bot. Right. <laughs> when you remember it's another person on the side, it's an incredible way to connect with people and have fun and meaningful conversations and networking. Like it's, it's unbelievable. So uh, I really like your approach because it's some people say like, Oh, take one day off a week or take yeah. two days off a week to unplug. But it really is. Tech is so integrated in our lives that it's hard to be that way. It's just really, you got to make sure you have, you don't overdo it at certain times. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's been, it's been 
ages since I really had any kind of a quote unquote vacation where I wasn't checking in on social media or whatever. And <laughs> right. I don't feel like we well, got to post Instagram. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like it's unhealthy. I, I feel like the, for me, there's a lot of joy that I get from connecting with other people. I'm yeah, never not way. present with the people that are around me, but I'm also trying to like, you know, sort of maintain these, these relationships that do matter to me that are online. So right. Mm -hmm. that that is always part and parcel of the process yeah and pretty recently i know you spoke at the un yeah, so yeah. i want to well first congratulate <laughs> you like that that's an incredible honor i'm <laughs> sure you're still probably in disbelief of <laughs> what was going on but uh what were you speaking about what was what was that experience like so this is uh it was for an organization called um one million one, one billion and it was the activate impact summit so this was all uh, bringing a bunch of young leaders and young entrepreneurs, sort of grade school and to maybe, I think, high school mm -hmm. students from around the world, a lot of them from India, um, who had created some sort of project that had some kind of impact on their community. And as as they had been able to improve the lives of, let's say, six people, this program is trying to help them scale that to like 600 people or oh, okay. something like that. And eventually, you know, with the idea that maybe this can improve the lives of 6 million or 6 billion people if they wow. get it right. So it's like cleaning water and, you know, making sure that people have access to right. you know, food and resources. And, you know, so uh, I was there on a panel about innovation. Mm -hmm. And what was really cool was uh, my friend Jennifer Ianolo, who uh, runs the company uh, organization called Imperia Global, she was the, the liaison for this. She had put together this panel and we did this innovation panel. It was myself and two other women. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was fantastic that we had this panel on innovation comprised entirely of women and it wasn't like a women in tech panel yeah, it wasn't you know we weren't talking amazing. about how hard it was to be women in tech or whatever right yeah. we were talking about like how to change the world with mm -hmm. innovation yeah and it was so inspiring and to be at the US. Yeah, like, yeah. Great. inspiring to be part of that and also inspiring to see these young people who yeah. are doing such important work so i mean right, yeah. the, there's a lot of hope for the future if you look at what these kids are doing that's so cool. And was it crazy from like the security standpoint or like, did it yeah, feel like a yeah. super private thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Getting through security was, you know, a little onerous, but as you would expect, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was funny. It was, um, that was on February 1st. My January was, uh, full of craziness too. The really good stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I was, I spoke at CES. My book was featured at CES. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I had a tweet go viral, which turned into a Wired article, which went viral. And then I was like on every media outlet known to man, you know, like, it was right. It was a great time. Was that the first time one of your tweets had gone viral to that extent? To that extent. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, everybody gets like hits the, the mark once in a while where you start right. to see, you know, some some real numbers on your likes or retweets or whatever. But right. this this was something that was clearly driving some cultural conversation Yeah, where it was taking off in an, a way I had never experienced that people really wanted to take it into all kinds of different directions. And, and I I, just to clarify, in case anybody doesn't know that the reference, um, you know, <laughs> this whole, not following Kato, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it was a, a big conversation, but the whole 10 year challenge that was going on where people were posting yeah. an old photo along with a new photo and saying like, here's me 10 years ago, here's me now that became this viral sensation also. And I had commented <laughs> that, you know, what if someone was harvesting this data to train a facial recognition algorithm right. on age progression? And it was kind of a flippant, you know, thought experiment more than it was a serious tweet. Mm -hmm. But people were pushing back on it in a way that I was just like, well, wait, 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 wait. There's some, right. <laughs> some legitimate consideration here. Like we should really explore what, yeah. what this means and what it looks like that <laughs> we contribute this structured data that semi-structured data that right. that is tagged that's helpfully you know kind of curated and so we need to have that conversation and it ties back into this part of the conversation you and i just had about how we need to become more sophisticated and savvy about right. what we contribute online and what we share mm -hmm. so it, it was thrilling to me that that turned into a big conversation about that and i got to have that conversation on yeah. like NPR and Marketplace and like BBC News and oh you know, all God. kinds so of stuff. So that really took yeah. on a life of its own. I mean, I remember <laughs> I saw it being shared everywhere. Obviously, it was going crazy on Twitter, but I saw it on my LinkedIn as well. And I'm, I'm just like, oh my God, Kate is everywhere. Like this is <laughs> this is insane. So that's... that's an it was an exhausting thing. run for a couple of weeks, but I yeah. was really, really delighted that um, people, <laughs> people really wanted to have that conversation. And what I felt like it did was give us the opportunity to start having this bigger conversation about 
privacy and, and all these yep. things we just talked about, right? Like about exactly. the data we share and what it means in terms of the trade-offs and how we need to think about that, how we hold companies accountable, how we bring government into it and what we right. are, are accountable for ourselves. Right. So, and then this podcast will go viral right after we post it. So <laughs> they'll be pretty, so get ready to do the same interviews all over I'm again. I'm so but... over virality. <laughs> let's, let's just keep it to that's, ourselves. That's so early 2019. <laughs> Can you imagine getting a 100% open rate on your next marketing message? Well, you can with extra large postcards that are impossible to ignore. Hippo Direct can help you find the perfect list of proven direct mail responders. We can even help lay out and design the postcard for you. Check us out at hippodirect.com. Let's touch on creativity for a little bit. Mm. It's one of my favorite topics to touch on. To start, what do you do to stay creative? I don't know that there's a thing that anyone has to do to stay creative. Like we all are creative, right? I think that Mm -hmm. if you're just paying attention to the world and it's that whole thing, the same idea with the whole not, not digitally detoxing, right? If you (laughs) pay attention to the world, if you pay attention to the people around you, uh, there's so much inspiration I find at least Mm -hmm. to just spark new thought off of what people are saying, what people are doing. Why is that person doing that thing? Why are they dressed that way? Like, you know, I just, (laughs) Is the dress black and blue or (laughs) white and gold? (laughs) Well, in New York is such a great place for um, being inspired by what people do or what people wear, what people say, you know, it's a, anywhere you go though, I think you can, you can find inspiration in what's around you. Yeah. What ways do you find inspiration then? Like, is it social media platforms? Is it books? I think it's mostly conversations. Uh, yeah. I really love, yeah. There we go. Well, thank you for having this conversation with me. <laughs> it's very inspiring. There we go. Uh, no, I, I love going out with friends for drinks or whatever. And, and um, these kinds of conversations that start winding into, you know, 10 different subjects. Mm-hmm. And you find at the end of the conversation that you've touched on things that circle back around to something earlier. Right. I come away from those conversations inevitably connecting dots that I hadn't connected before. And yeah. so, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of just talking to people. I think there's probably more of my, my work has been inspired by conversations with other people <laughs> than <laughs> any other kind of, you know, research or, yeah. or work. Are there any specific conversations you can point to? I wish I could. I, I think they all just, it's, it's one of the quirks of my brain that things blur together in some ways and like I really well, you like have, that. you've done a few things over the years no, it's, not, it's not even that I feel like it's just for me the it's kind of this aggregate sense of joy of like the the delight of having these conversations mm-hmm. is all kind of a level of joy so it's yeah it's not like one necessarily jumps out more than the others yeah is that code word like would you have a conversation with a, a woman named joy that... <laughs> yeah it's really <laughs> she stands out yeah she does uh well, that's a big fan of joy but how about new technology and you know gadgets things that you try out how do you learn about those things? Yeah, it's a really good question because actually I'm I'm uh, really cautious and conservative about the technology that I use in my home. Mm-hmm. I, I don't have smart speakers. I don't have yeah. um, you know a lot of that a lot of this automation home automation stuff. I don't I don't use. Mm-hmm. Um, I just I find that there's not enough precedent for what it's going to look like if any of that goes badly. <laughs> yeah. Do you have like a 1920s radio? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've got rabbit right. ears. Just on my just to TV. paint a picture. Yeah. <laughs> Those damn rabbit ears, they always... <laughs> yeah. So the way that, you know, and of course I write about emerging technology and speak mm-hmm. about emerging technology. So it's important to stay up on that stuff. So I find that the, the easiest way for me to, um, to stay up on that is to have partners that I, I have, like corporate partners, mm-hmm. research partners, and I will go and visit their lab spaces, their businesses, see the, the products in action. I'll have demos done. Um, and those end up being conversations too that I, that are really inspiring. <laughs> right. Going back to that. Yeah. But I don't I don't think that having the latest and greatest emerging technology or gadgets mm-hmm. in your home all the time is necessarily uh, a good approach at the moment. We just yeah. I, I think without having the right protections in place for mm-hmm. what that ambient data is going to how it's going to be used, how it's going to be protected, and so on. I, I'm right. not ready to, to be a guinea pig on that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Like I enjoy trying out new things, but not to the extreme. Like I, you know, there's that chart of like the innovative, like early adopters, that sort of thing. Like I'm more towards the middle left of that, I guess. Whereas Typically, when something's brand new, I'll wait a little bit before I adopt it. And then usually, 
you know, second or third iteration of these things is way better or cheaper. <clears throat> uh, my favorite part. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> um, that's true too. In the too. first place, so yeah. it's like sometimes it it's cool to hear about things, but like don't always jump in right away. Yeah, so. I don't know. I mean, I, I want to experience them, so I'm glad that I do have these partners that I can go right. to their spaces and, and try the things out. Right, yeah, you I try mean, out I'm, their hoverboard. I'm super, stuff. yeah, super excited always to, to <laughs> learn about the new technologies. I just don't necessarily want to uh, have them in my home. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Your 1920s home. My so, 1920s home. Well, it's funny because I actually, when I lived in Nashville, I had an 1820s home. So, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh my so, God, the bicentennial home. Wow. I think my <laughs> New York apartment is probably 1920s or something like wow, that. Wow, I'm sure uh, Reed Hastings was planning Netflix Reed? back in the 1820s too. He's so. <laughs> <laughs> pivoted so much. He's pivoted then. a lot yeah, in the 19th century. <laughs> Let's move to a segment here that's a, a fan favorite, a recurring segment called the Wild Business Shoutout of the Week. The Wild Business Shoutout of the Week! <laughs> <laughs> excellent. So, excellent. I'll shout out Wayne's World. But the uh, <laughs> earlier, so this is the section where we cover a recent campaign or re- something that's going on sort of in the marketing tech world, uh, business world that caught our attention. So, you mentioned something about a certain astronaut. You want to touch on that <laughs> yeah. a little bit? Yeah, uh, it's. <laughs> Kind of funny because it, it's not a business campaign or a, or a typical mm-hmm. what you think of as a business campaign. I would say it's a wild it's a, campaign, though. It's yeah, a, <laughs> but it's a marketing campaign in a mm-hmm. sense. Mark Kelly just announced his candidacy for Senate in Arizona, and mm-hmm. um, you know he's the husband of Gabby Giffords. He's a uh, retired astronaut who served on the space shuttle, two two different mm-hmm. missions on the space shuttle. By the way, that must be very tiring being an astronaut. I'm sure he's ready to <laughs> calm down and stay on this planet <laughs> he for a while. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> like I can't imagine what your sleep cycle is like. Yeah, it's exhausting. It's like a, a long workout, but but he's no. like a, a former Navy fighter pilot and everything. So I mean, yeah. it's just an interesting character mm-hmm. to enter a political candidacy. Yeah, uh, and whether you are politically aligned with him or not, I just mm-hmm. found his uh, his introductory ad mm-hmm. kind of laying out his background and his um, sort of the beginnings of his platform to be a really compelling one. Mm-hmm. Partly because he leans on. His history, his mom was a really influential character. Gabby is clearly an influential character to him. Mm-hmm. Like, so he's bringing in the narratives of other people and how they've influenced him uh, and what they, how they're going to shape the way he, he approaches policy if he gets right. elected. So I think it's a really, really compelling mm-hmm. campaign. It's long, actually, I think, for an yeah. introductory campaign video. What was the biggest thing that stood out to you about? Like, was it the, the fact that he weaved these stories together? Yeah, I think that's it. It's like the, that, um, I think a lot of, a lot of politician campaign ads seem like there's, they have to be so much about policy and platform. And I think that's important at a certain stage, mm-hmm. but when you're just getting to know a candidate, it feels like what you really want to understand is what kind of a person are they? Right. Yeah. And are they a real person? Are yeah. They, <laughs> are, they, <laughs> are they a bot? Right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Uh, but you know, it is so true and it goes back to your passion and this movement about the human element yeah and so yeah it's, that's, that's a, good, a great example it, it fits really well with, with your vibe so it's well, a, and it's i think we out. all are a composite of the people that influence yeah. us right mm-hmm. so to me that's a really meaningful component of of this campaign and of right. a lesson for everybody i think even in a business marketing context yeah the business that you run is a composite of the people who make it up so the right. more you understand mm-hmm. that and can bring the elements that are influential to bear and make mm-hmm. them transparent, make them relatable and compelling, the more successful I think that campaign is going to be. In your standpoint, you could just feel your conversation with joy coming up. Yeah. <laughs> this is a segment called The Unusual. So this is Pet Peeves. Quirks and weird talents. My pet peeves yes. and my quirks. Yours, and yeah. My... <laughs> so, so what's your biggest pet peeve or, or one that comes to mind? Oh my gosh, I don't know. Or anything, I don't or anything know. that like grinds your gears. That any. Uh... I'm really such a relaxed person. I like very little grinds my gears. Like I, okay. um, I take everything kind of as it is. So right. I, I don't you really do have, have a, a very pet peeve. positive out, outlook on life. Yeah, and... I do. Yeah. Okay. All right. So no pet <laughs> so peeves. No pet peeves All right. That, at least they come to mind. Oh, for one. All right. Oh, one count. <laughs> <I'm sorry>. uh, <laughs> how about quirks? Uh, you met. You even used the word quirk earlier. So hopefully, you have a quirk example. <laughs> <laughs> well, anything about you that family or friends somebody's called out and it's just like Kate like why do you do that or why it's uh but it's interesting it's part of your personality <laughs> I and I, I have a ton so like really no give me enough. an example of yours maybe it'll inspire a thought on my end so like I 
Like, I just don't like drinking out of straws. Like, I prefer <laughs> to just drink, like... So, like, I'm thinking... Like, things like that. Like, it's not... These are minor things, but they're... Okay. I don't oh. know. I have cats, and I don't know that that's quirky. But, it could be. Yeah. I, I, I associate oh, cats with quirky. What's okay. I, at one time, I had six cats. So that's, oh, there you go. That's kind of quirky. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm down to two, but yeah, six at once, I think, was probably qualification for quirk. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Cool. By but, the way, when you have six cats at once, you learn about like the societies that cats have. Like There's really? hierarchy within them. It's no really, way. really fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> there's a whole podcast discussion so you had, had you about had, that. You had, like, when you had six cats, you had like your focus groups. Like You would just uh-huh. observe them and see. I was a tech okay, feline. Well, that's the leader. That's the one. <laughs> tech feline. <laughs> there we go. There's a sequel if you want to get to the pet space. How about weird talents? Any random thing that you're good at that doesn't really have too much of a purpose, but... You can do it. I know one. I unintentionally pun all the time. Oh, like, me too. Do you really? Yeah, no like, way. That's I mean, funny. I think I yeah. do it intentionally now and then, <laughs> but like I do it unintentionally oh, I, that's constantly. The well, that's like a real talent thing because I <laughs> will try to make the pun. And I, I do, I, my brain kind of thinks in puns. Yeah. Like I see ties to it naturally. So that thing is always, it's always been a big thing that I, I joke about, I guess. But how do you unintentionally pun? That's a real. You're an unintentional pun humanist. You know how people <laughs> say, yeah, like people will say like no pun intended. I mean, I literally, I feel like I could say that after almost every sentence that I say most of the time. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Is that like when you mentioned, you brought up Fritter and Twitter and Yeah, you know, I like mean, that's, think, that's maybe not a pun exactly, well, but, right. but yeah, but like there's all these little quirks of wordplay. I think I've just been doing <laughs> wordplay and, you know, goofing around with writing for my whole life. So right. it sort of happens at some weird, yeah. you know, sort of right. uh, unconscious level of and my that, brain. And that's a unique talent too. I mean, you mentioned a few languages that you studied right off the bat. How many languages do you know and how many of those are you fluent in? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that's always the tricky question. So I'd say that other than English, obviously, um, I would only call myself fluent-ish in German. I'm rusty, but I'm fluent You almost said Flemish there, though. (laughs) (laughs) But I can get by in like French and Spanish and Italian. And Mm -hmm. and, uh, I studied like as many as, I don't know, 10 or 12, uh, just for (laughs) short amounts of time, not to any level of proficiency. Oh my God. But I I love it. I love it because they're just fascinating. Fascinating to me. So yeah. um, I studied a year of Mandarin Chinese, and I got as far as being able to say Wu Shan Megaren, which is like I'm an American, which I will, will either get me into trouble or out of trouble. I'm going to trust you on this one because I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to look it up in this moment, but we'll we'll go with it. <laughs> Do you have any tips for anybody that's looking to learn a language and not have it like take over their life with time consuming? Don't learn five at once. That's <laughs> you did five at once. <laughs> I did when I was in college. Oh my god! I was taking like did you have six cats at once semester? at that time too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like a semester, I was in Russian, French, Italian, Spanish, and German classes all at once, and they were so confused in my head. <laughs> so what? language did you dream in because i know that's a thing oh yeah it was definitely a lot of german dreams which are kind of aggressive (laughs) right (laughs) yeah oh my god that's interesting no and i love it language learning is is such a fascinating um Mm -hmm. thing to be able to do and i think it's it's a thrill that we have you know like humans have created languages and that that's a thing that exists yeah so I kind of think like because I'm such a um, an infovore, like I just mm-hmm. can't help myself. I'm driven by curiosity. I want to know as much as there is to know. Yeah. And so like I want to speak all the languages, but of course like there is a limit on yeah. what you can reasonably acquire. There is, yeah. And it's <laughs> I uh, and it's got to be so good for your brain too, just expanding that knowledge because it's literally literally like a foreign language. You're learning a foreign language, like it's something totally different. I'm actually reading right now *Sapiens*. Have you read it? I have uh, skimmed it. I you skimmed read it. it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's long, but it's so good. Uh, *Sapiens* by I'm going to butcher this, but Yuval Noah Harari, something like that. But previous guest uh, Danielle Dardashti, she's huge in the uh, branded content space. We had her on, and she like could not stop raving about this book. And so finally, I started reading it earlier this year, and it just goes back to what you were saying that like with these languages, like it's fascinating when you take a step back. They're all made up by humans. Yeah. Like it's made up over generations, generations. Obviously, it's become commonplace, but it's really interesting. And now it's like things that people have just made up that you can literally 
study and learn five at once, apparently. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and then, then they some, somewhat reflect their place and they somewhat reflect culture and they somewhat reflect, you know, periods of history. And, and I just find that yeah. fascinating, too, that there are these kind of like living artifacts, you know, of, of right. life in different places and different times. So mm-hmm. that's fascinating, too. It is. Yeah. And so uh, we only got a little bit of time left. We're going to wrap up with some rapid fire Q&A. Mm. Are you ready for it? And I'm as ready as I'm going to be. There we go. Yeah, we'll, we'll ask you again afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get wild. What you, you bounce around a lot geographically. Yes. What's your favorite city you've ever lived in? New York City. There we go. And you're, I know, you're in Hell's Kitchen area. <laughs> I am, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, it's a great, it's been a great culmination of everything I've ever loved about every city I've lived in. And I've loved them all. Mm-hmm. Um, New York is just that and more. It's just, yeah. uh, it's, well, so, it has, it's so, so much, fast and like cool. literally either... You never run out of things to do and you never run out of things to get inspired by. So No. Right. And people to be inspired by. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to try to keep focused for the rest of this because like yeah. you, I really enjoy conversations. So <laughs> rapid fire Q&A is yeah. like hard New for York. me. All right. What's your favorite app on your phone? Oh, Evernote, I think. Mm. Yeah. I use yeah. it a lot. How about favorite Netflix show or favorite Netflix thing to watch right now? I do a lot of the, the I binge a lot of the series and I think we just yeah. got done. What did we just get done? Just finished what kind on. of what genre? Oh, sex education. Oh, so I heard about yeah. Yeah, that one was really great. Yeah, just finished that one. Just finished sex ed. I missed it in high school, but oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, and it was good. I think uh, was, it, it was comedy or was it? Uh, there was a lot of comedy in it. Yeah. Um, I now have seen a few of my friends sort of talking about some of the problematic aspects of it, but oh, whatever. Okay. We can, yeah, maybe. I'm not. I'm not as familiar with those, but I have heard about that one. And that's a, a hot, <laughs> hot sex thing. Um, <laughs> I know you've played a lot of instruments too. What instrument was your favorite to play? Well, the and one I, I still do. The one I really played the best or the most was clarinet, and that I played mm-hmm. that for a, the longest time. Oh, but Squidward it, tentacles here. But <laughs> instruments, instruments were like languages to me. I ended up acquiring um, a dozen or more of them just because I was so fascinated and I wanted to learn how to how to play. I'm sure I wasn't any good on like flute, for example. But yeah. um, but well, I the woodwinds seem very it. tough. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's about all I know about woodwinds. Is the well, wood, I think wood, once wood. you have like one <laughs> category, like if you can do woodwinds, you can do pretty much all the woodwinds. Yeah. But going over to brass, for example, was a whole different ballgame. Yeah. Now I have an image in my head of you having six cats, you know, 25 instruments, <laughs> learning five languages at the same time. Have you been That's peeking incredible. at my apartment? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, last one here. If you were stranded on an island and you couldn't have any technology... And this isn't like life or death. It's just kind of okay. like to entertain yourself or have something, an object with you. What would it be? No bat- no batteries allowed. No no tech. A book, I guess, and it would have to be a good book because apparently I'm going to be reading it again and again and again. Okay. So yeah. what book do you want to show them? Besides your own books, <laughs> in addition to your. Own. <laughs> I probably wouldn't want to read a business book again and again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> you're on an island. What are you going to do? You start a business with nothing. <laughs> island entrepreneurs yeah. maybe an interesting Is there any, podcast. Like, fiction to start. ones you've read or I don't read a lot of fiction. Or... Yeah, I like I love nonfiction. Okay. Um, you know, one of the ones that I read recently, I think it's called 17 Equations That Changed the World or something like that. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty specific. <laughs> I mean, I may have the number wrong or something, but... Yeah. Um, Maybe it has the, like, tilde, like, oh, it's about 17 <laughs> equations. That it's like it. pi equations that change the world. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they, that was a really good one. And I don't know that I would want to read it again and again, but uh, I right. might. But it comes I to might. mind sub- yeah. subconsciously. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, I know we got to wrap up here. Thank you so much, Kate. This has been a ton of fun. Thank you. I mean, I had a blast. Can't wait to share it out. And you, your career is amazing. I'm excited to stay in touch and see what you do next. Thank you. Um, you know, you, already this year you've gone viral and you spoke at the UN. So who knows <laughs> what the hell is next? But yeah. Um, Big thanks again for coming on. And I want to make sure uh, I don't forget. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? Um, so I'm on Twitter a lot. And that is Kate O, K-A-T-E-O. Mm-hmm. Or you can find me on my website, koinsights.com. Perfect. Okay. Shout out Kate O. And last line here. The stage is yours. Any uh, quote or single line that you want to end up with? What message do you want to leave with? I just think, again, I would come back to that that idea from Tech Humanist that we have the opportunity to create the best futures for the most people. So I would love to see us focus on that. Perfect. The Tech Humanist, the Tech Felinist, the unintentional <laughs> pun artist. Thank you so much, Kate O. <laughs> Thank you. Kate OMG, thank you so much. You are a fantastic human. 
Thank you, wild listeners, for tuning into another episode. If you'd like to show off your ability to be a savvy human of tech, here's some things you can do while it's top of mind. Subscribe and leave a five-star review for the Wild Business Growth Podcast on your favorite podcast app, including Apple Podcasts. And while you're at it, check out our blog full of business growth tips at hippodirect.com slash blog and your weekly recap of creative marketing, the Hippo Digest. It's at hippodirect.com slash newsletter. And don't forget to connect with us on your favorite social media platforms with the handles Hippo Direct and Max Brandstetter for marketing tips, business growth advice, podcasting help, and tons of hippo fun. That's all for this episode. Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!